And in the meanwhile, I think we will welcome um, Mona O'Brien to the podium, or the microphones. Um, Mona, if you'd like to come up, thank you. Um, so uh, Mona O'Brien is... Oh, OK, OK. Um, is uh, working at the University of Glasgow and is going to give us a talk, talk from a little further away than uh, 2000 um, on essential but su suspect medical practitioners, Franz Ozen Erzer in Nuremberg, 90, 1495 to 1560. Dr. Brian. So thank you very much for having me here this evening. I'm delighted and honored to be presenting my research to you. In the winter of 1494 to 1495, Charles VIII of France laid siege to the city of Naples. As the soldiers returned to their home places after the conflict in Italy, in France, in Spain, in Germany, even to Scotland, contemporaries in Western Europe began to comment on the appearance of a strange new sickness. Widely known as the French pox, victims of the disease suffered with outbreaks of ulcerations and pustules on their body, as you can see on the slide. They suffered with agonizing pains in their limbs, particularly at night. And in its most horrific form, the disease would rot away the bones of its living victims. One contemporary witness, Josef Grunpeck, commented that those who became infected prayed for death to come as soon as possible. As I'm sure many of you know, the French pox is today associated with syphilis. However, many historians such as John Henderson, Claudia Stein, and myself argue that when we talk about this disease in its early modern context, we ought to use an early modern term for this. And Stein very succinctly um, summarizes our reason, reasoning for this when she states that diseases are, quote, sociocultural constructs that are specific to a particular scientific and sociocultural setting at a given time. Uh, to put this another way, what we mean is we ought to use terms for the disease which reflect the medical and cultural understanding of the disease in the historical period that we're talking about. So for this reason, I'll be using the term French pox and not syphilis during this presentation. So for the past three years, I have been investigating how the city of Nuremberg dealt with outbreaks of epidemic disease. And all of the research that I'm presenting to you here this evening is drawn from my archival work in the City and State Archive of Nuremberg. In 1496, the French pox arrived into Nuremberg. At this point, the city had a population of somewhere between 20 to 35,000, and it was governed by its Rat, or city council. This council was comprised of the city's elite men, and um, it essentially governed the city autonomously. Uh, the only person who could intervene in the government was the Holy Roman Emperor, and he did this very seldomly indeed. Once the French pox arrived in the city, the council immediately began to take action to try and control its spread. It was believed to be incredibly contagious. One of the first measures they took was to order the inspection of pigs because pig meat was seen as a, a frequent carrier of diseases in this period. I'm afraid the top illustration of the pig on trial is completely fictitious. Um, the, uh, the council also ordered that anyone infected with the disease ought to proceed to the hospital of the Heilig Kreuz, which was situated outside of the city walls, thus putting some distance between them and the healthy population. It's a pretty small um, city space in early modern Nuremberg. In addition, uh, sick beggars were not allowed to beg in the city anymore. This was common practice, but this was uh, outlawed to try and stop the spread of the disease. At this time in Western Europe, not only in Germany, but elsewhere too, there was widespread anxiety that the French pox was an incurable disease. And this was an anxiety that persists into the early 16th century as well. And this fear is very well summarized by the broadsheet that you can see on the slide. This broadsheet was authored by Theodoricus Olsenius, who was a physician uh, in the, in, employed by the city council of Nuremberg. And in this broadsheet, which is a Latin poem in 100 hexameters, he explains how the city physicians of Nuremberg had no idea how to cure this disease. They didn't know what to do about it. They spent all of their time arguing with each other about how to treat this disease, but come to no conclusions. And in the meanwhile, people suffer, suffer horribly and die of the disease. And the only hope that they have in Olsenius' viewpoint is to pray. 
However, Nuremberg's Council wasn't satisfied with this. They wanted to not only protect their healthy population, but do something for their suffering citizens as well. So going through the records of the City Council, I've seen how they actively sought out um, how they actively sought out medical recipes and medical practitioners who could treat this disease. And in 1497, finally, for the first time, the city found a Franzosen Arzt, or a doctor of the French pox, someone they believed they could treat, that could treat this disease. So in this paper, what I want to look at is who were these Franzosen Ärzte, that's the plural term, what was their role in Nuremberg, I'm going to show how they threatened Nuremberg's traditional medical hierarchy in the 16th century. And through this exploration, I hope to make an appeal for the importance of studying these practitioners for the history of medicine. While some historical studies have looked at pox specialists in Britain and Italy, no one has looked at the unique category of Franzosenärzte in Germany. I'm the first person to give a sustained study of these practitioners, and I hope to show why this is important work that we need to build on today. So a 16th century order from the City Council of Nuremberg outlined the role of the Franzosenärzte in the city. It ordered that they were to treat the poxed, and these were poor patients whose, uh, whose care was paid for in the city's St. Sebastian Pox Hospital. In addition to this, they were, required to, um, they were required to treat any person who offered to pay them for private care as well. So the city council trusted them with care of citizens across the social spectrum. And there was a genuine belief in the efficacy of these practitioners. Throughout the council records, we see constant references to how, to how they heal the poor, to how they heal the sick. So to look a little bit more at who these individuals were, some of them came from Nuremberg itself, and others came from outside the city. Some of them come from within Germany. So uh, one comes from, Bavaria, uh, from Lindau in Bavaria in 1518, and another came from Prague in 1522. And there are further ones who, um, whose location, their origin location is not unfortunately disclosed in the records. These were practitioners who were trained through apprenticeship, very similarly to barber surgeons and military field surgeons at this time. Indeed, many of them may have started off as barber surgeons and then specialized, especially with the arrival of the disease. Therefore, um, this apprenticeship training and this specialization, specialization placed them within the category uh, during what was known during the 15th and 16th century in Germany of empirics. These are, again, people trained through apprenticeships who specialized in a very particular field of medicine. So you had the eye doctors, the so-called teeth doctors, and, of course, the Franzosen Ärzte as well. And these practitioners became an absolutely integral part of public health care in late 15th and early 16th century Nuremberg. As I said, um, they were entrusted with the care of the city's sick poor in the hospital, for which, of course, the council paid. They were entrusted to treat the wealthier citizens as well, privately. Um, and we see how deeply the council valued them when we look, at, uh, when we look through the records. In 1497, Nuremberg's council granted citizenship to one of these Franzosenärzte. Um, this practitioner had been in the city no more than a year, and this is highly unusual. Nuremberg was very precious with who it granted citizenship to. And in contrast, Heinrich Wolf, an extremely well-respected physician, he took eight years to gain his citizenship. So this was a really fast grant, and it shows how much value the city council was placing on these practitioners. In general, in society, beyond the medical sphere, empirics, uh, like the Franzosen Ärzte, were routinely exalted as uh, Saunders, Murphy, uh, Saunders Murphy's broader study of medical practice in Germany has shown. Um, and we see this respect amongst the council um, and records from the general population as well. And looking at what the Franzosen Ärzte earned, they were earning really substantial amounts of money. In February 1540, the Nuremberg Council paid one Franzosen Ärzte the huge sum of 15 golden. Meanwhile, in Zwickau, another German city, the uh, Franzosen Arzt was earning enough to buy 10.9 kilograms of the best beef at the time, which is, uh, which is no small amount of beef. Um, so all of this shows how rapidly, first of all, uh, and how deeply the council came to value these practitioners who gained considerable economic and social uh, capital within the city of Nuremberg. 
And this was not particularly to the taste of the city's physicians. These university-educated practitioners had traditionally dominated the city's medical hierarchy, um, and they had always had the ear of the council in regulating medical practice, in deciding who could practice inside the city. But while they were floundering and fighting over the cure, these Franzosniers came in and became quite influential and quite powerful and quite valued by the council in a very small amount of time. We see this in a city quite close to Nuremberg, in Augsburg, where the physicians Johann and Ambrosius Jung published a lament that there were many unqualified practitioners um, treating the pox in the city. Um, and this was a stab at the Franzosenärzte. Augsburg City Council had just hired a number of these practitioners, uh, these Franzosenärzte, to work in the city's municipal pox hospital. So again, the physicians kind of feeling that their role was being taken away from them. Quite similarly, in Nuremberg, the very famous physician Jochen Camerarius complained how all kinds of non-native practitioners, so including Franzosen and Erzte, uh, people who were coming in from outside the city were coming in and lying about their qualifications and practicing very badly. Um, and one, we can point to many, many more um, examples of these often published accounts by physicians complaining in, against the Franzosen and Erzte, trying to tear them down to take away some of this status that they were so rapidly gathering in, um, in the civic sphere in Nuremberg and beyond in Germany as well. Um, from the evidence that exists in Nuremberg, it seems that the, um, that the physicians did manage to keep the ear of the council, at least to, to some point, um, because in the, early in the early 16th century, the council passed a regulation that any Francois and artist who was going to practice in the city would have to be examined by the municipal physicians. So this gave them back a little bit of that control that they wanted. Um, and another reason for the council, of course, taking this measure was that there was, um, there was always the chance of fraudulent practice. And in 1518, indeed, one of Nuremberg's own citizens was found to be a fake Franzos and Arzt. So after 1557, the Franzos and Arzt, without any warning, without any explanation, disappear from Nuremberg's municipal records. I've looked at these records for the years 1495 to 1700, and they never reappear again. Um, and I offer some arguments as, as to why these practitioners so suddenly disappear. In the 1550s, Nuremberg surgeons and physicians argued that they had found um, a standard method by which the pox could be treated. It was a method that was reliant on the plant that you see on the slide, guaiacum, uh, and they felt that this was one that was applicable to most patients that effectively cured the disease, uh, and they seemed to have convinced the council of this as well. In addition to this, there was a significant rise in numbers of municipal physicians and municipal surgeons employed by the council across the 16th century. These uh, were multi-talented practitioners who, with this standardized treatment, could treat the French pox, but in addition to that, they could treat a whole other range of ailments as well. And Nuremberg's council was notoriously tight with the purse strings, uh, so why bother to pay these specialized Franzosen and Erste as well when you have practitioners that can treat the disease? In the 16th century too, Nuremberg's economy began to slow down quite significantly, especially by the mid part of the century. And very significantly, Nuremberg was quite deeply affected by the Second Margrave's War in the mid-century, and this involved the burning down of the St. Sebastian Pox Hospital. This hospital took 10 years to reopen, and when it did, it was staffed entirely by physicians and surgeons. So I hope in this brief paper today that I've first of all given you an insight into an alternative approach to the history of the French pox. The history of this disease has very often been taken as one of crisis, of suffering, uh, and of terror, to use the word of Claude Cattell. But this is also a moment of opportunity, a moment of enterprise, where these empirical, these, um, these new medical practitioners found a gap and found, um, found a place for themselves to emerge. And I hope uh, I've illustrated how, by examining these practitioners, we can gain a unique insight into the emergence, the development, and uh, indeed here, the disappearance of a totally different, a totally new category of medical practitioner in 15th and 16th century Germany, 
looking at these practitioners, we can learn about how the medical hierarchy worked, how practitioners um, interacted, especially with civic hierarchies and with each other as well, and the kind of rivalries and, ten and tensions that existed. It's also very important to note that although uh, in Nuremberg, where I've done most of my study, the Franzosen disappeared in 1557, they kept practicing elsewhere in Germany much later on. Uh, there was a municipal Franzosen arzt employed in Schwickau until 1573, and Tobias Knobloch, another physician, complained about Franzosen Ärzte and their, in his words, poor practice in 1620. So I feel that there is still a wealth of research to be done. Uh, it's research I very much hope to undertake to discover how these physician, uh, how these practitioners, sorry, not physicians, how these Franzosen Ärzte practiced, how they interacted with medical and civic hierarchies across the German lands, um, how, how their careers panned out in other places, and as well what I'd really like to find out is more about how they interacted with their patients too. So, herzlichen vielen Dank für Ihre Aufmerksamkeit. Thank you very much. <laughs>